Yeah. Welcome to the final lecture in the um, faculty lecture series for the fall 2016. We do have um, a lineup for spring, and that will be out soon. If you would like to sign up for our um, listserv or our email list, um, you can do so tonight if you're not already on it, and that way you can get the, um, the schedule for the spring. Tonight we have esteemed Dr. Chris Gilmore, and he is talking, his talk is entitled Poetic Reflections on Mama and Them. So without further ado, <laughs> thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming out on a, a cold night. Thank you, Courtney and Christy and the faculty, faculty lecture series for letting me be a part of it. And when I came here to be Vice President of Academic Affairs, it was very important to me that I got to be a part of the faculty because there's never been a time in my life when I didn't have students. And some of my students are here tonight, which pleases me uh, very much. So thanks to the English department for taking me in and letting an old wayward English professor uh, be a part of the faculty. Um, as Cousin Minnie Pearl used to say on the Grand Ole Opry, howdy! And then she would say, I'm just so glad to be here and I'm just so glad you came. And um, that was her shtick and that's how I feel actually tonight. Um, I come from Mississippi as uh, most of you know. If very few faces I don't know in the room uh, tonight. Um, and as Sherwood Anderson mythologically said to William Faulkner, when Faulkner was at the beginning of his career not doing very well, uh, go back to that postage stamp of native soil where you started out and write about that. And I think maybe you'll have something to say. And I think we would all agree that William Faulkner ended up with something to say after he famously failed freshman composition at the University of uh, Mississippi. Um, but um, I don't liken myself to Faulkner, but I do come from that same uh, postage stamp of native soil. And I'm so happy to share a few poems with you tonight. Um, I've published a good deal of scholarly work, a good deal of journalism and creative nonfiction in my life. But I started out many years ago studying with Dr. Angela Ball, who's a, a fairly notable poet. Um, and uh, knowing that a poet was what I wanted to be. And life kind of intervened as it has a way of doing, and I've had a great life, but I've only come back to poetry over the last couple of years. And poetry seems to be all that I'm really wanting to uh, write anymore. Uh, my husband David and my late mother and I actually have essays in an anthology of Southern writers that's coming out in the spring. Um, but uh, poetry is, is what it is that I'm writing these days. And I want to share just three very short um, kind of movements of poetry with you. Uh, there's nothing here tonight that the Motion Picture Association would rate an R, though there are some things in my work uh, that are. Um, but there is some PG-13, and so I want to make you uh, aware of that. I'm going to start with two poems that are fairly uh, light and are probably the most autobiographical of the ones that I'm going to share with you tonight. And this first one is basically almost just a written um, uh, account of a conversation that I heard my uh, grandmother have once upon a time. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard my story, and I apologize to those who've heard it so many times, uh, you know, um, my mama was born on the kitchen table of a cotton shack in a field in Mississippi. Grew up in a house that you didn't have to go outside to feed the chickens, you just dropped the food through the floor uh, in, the, in the house. This is where I come from. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm actually very proud of it. It formed me into uh, who I am. That's my postage stamp of native soil. Mama, though she was poor, was a proper Southern woman in her mind. And she would have never, ever spoken aloud the word hemorrhoids. So I'm going to give you a bit of Southern vernacular before I start this poem. She might work her way up if she was talking to her closest sister to call it piles. So that's what the word, uh, the vernacular is here and I don't know if any of you ever experienced a party line but the first telephone that we had was a party line where many different families shared uh, the same uh, telephone line and Memo did like to talk on it and this one is called party line 
Cousin Franny's piles is acting up again. Dr. Madden says may have to cut them. I run that chicken clear to the pond before it give up. You got to admire its will to live. Mamma took a rare breath. Aunt Grace's only sign it was her turn. Almost three miles separating their daily gossips over the party line. Two shorts and one long. That was Mamma's ring. Picked a five-gallon bucket of green tomatoes off just four plants today. Go make some hot stuff pickles. Norris has gone to town after some nails to mend the barn door after Callie got loose and eat near every one of my strawberry plants. Old man Jenkins, is that you? Grace, I hear somebody breathing on the line. What is this world a coming to when a grown man ain't got nothing better to do? Two shorts and one long. That was Mamma's ring. <clears throat> um, the next is a poem that I read when I came to interview here. Um, it actually tells the story of how I got to become the first college graduate in my family and some of the sacrifices that some of the folks made for that to happen. And um, it's called Papa. He quit school in the first grade to plow the fields that fed his sisters. Seven in all, from Juanice to baby Glenda, and him the only boy. His papa was sorry, meaning he enjoyed a good summer nap, avoided the hoe in the cotton sack, was known to drink, even when it wasn't Saturday. Most of Mama's days were consumed with earnest prayers and rocking babies, cleaning turnips and gutting fish. He could not read. Loved to watch Walter Cronkite on the black and white TV, also Sanford and Son. He taught me the capitals of every state from Bismarck to Santa Fe. Smiled from deep inside as I recited them often to company. His wife traded on credit at the general store. Three sons inherited that same good name. When he shook hands, the deal was struck. He plowed the fields that fed his family until he died on Thanksgiving Day at 74. 11 months after she went underground on a cold New Year's Day. 50 acres and a Massey Ferguson tractor all his own, withered and brown from decades of sun on topsoil, unrecognizable the little fair-skinned child in the one photograph from so long ago. He taught me the capitals of every state from Augusta to Sacramento, so cows to send his only grandson to college and now early in the morning when the city is quiet as hot July sun on the endless terrace rows of my youth. These words escape my mouth in his voice. Boise, Idaho, Juneau, Alaska, Jackson, Mississippi. I was blessed with wonderful, wonderful grandparents. I spent the happiest days of my life, probably on their little farm uh, out in the country in a little, it wasn't even a town, uh, out from a town, a little settlement called uh, Damascus, Mississippi. Uh, the next uh, poems move into a little bit, um, a little bit of a, a darker place, I guess it would be safe to say. It wasn't always easy to be a gay boy growing up in rural Mississippi. It wasn't always easy to be a woman or a person of color or uh, someone who had different religious beliefs. And a lot of my work confronts racism and misogyny and homophobia and things of that nature. And um, these aren't the sternest poetic reflections I have on that subject, but we'll move into a couple of poems uh, about that. If you woke up in my mamma's house on Sunday morning, it was not a matter of whether you were going to church uh, or not. It was a given that you were going to the Damascus Primitive Baptist Church where Elder Hilton would be preaching that morning and dinner on the ground would be served most of the time after that. And all of the grandmothers would rehearse with their various grandchildren. Now honey, look at this dish right here. You see this white one with the little specks on it. That's Mamaw's dish. That's the one that you need to eat out of, okay? Because it'll be clean, okay? And you can eat from Aunt Mary's dish or you can eat from, but don't eat, mm -mm, don't eat out of uh, those dishes over there. You know, better not do that. Um, this one is called uh, Foot Washing Baptist. 
Mamaw never got paid for a single pedicure. And Jesus Christ is the only man these women ever served on their knees, much to the chagrin of their husbands, and only in the church house, true Mary Magdalene's all. When Elder Hilton, Hilton delivered the call, they came with basins and pitchers, towels and well water and all due humility to the altar of their Lord, where they prayed earnestly and gently washed the feet of the congregation, as the Bible commanded. Then rose to all day singing with dinner on the ground, one excommunication for adultery, Mamma's baby sister today, and a little light gossip while the buffet was being spread, and surety and peace like a river that somehow never attended my way. This is the oldest poem in the group. I wrote this poem years and years and years ago, and I'm actually completing a chapbook of poetry, which I would hope to publish when I get it done. Uh, this was actually a poem that I published in a, uh, an anthology some years ago, and many, many years ago, actually, and it's called Fisher Ruth. She caught brim and goggle eye, mudcat, hate, largemouth bass, Turtles which by, died by the knife, and my own human soul. She loved some of us, ate some of us, watched us suffocate on a dry pond dam inside of water. Let some of us go gently into the cool, nurturant darkness. Her hook was sharp, true, worth the sting. Crickets and mercurial minnows danced mirror ball with sun floated, banana moon pies, sweet lemonade, long red worms touched only in nightmares, sequin scales, deep black eyes, horrible in acceptance of childless murderer, scent of blood, guts, cloudy orange eggs, homemade soap wouldn't scrub away before I ate flesh for supper, wondering, do fish have souls? I was a little boy, arms around her dungaree waist. She's scarcely feminine with age, the day she said, no woman has ever been a fish. We are corks. When he pulls, we must go under. The poems I read you to start with, very, very autobiographical. The poems I'm reading you now are more drawn from the experience that I watched a lot of people have in the postage stamp of native soil where I grew up. Not necessarily things that uh, happened to me, but emotions with which uh, I, I resonate, things that are uh, similar in some way. This one is called Paper Mache Daddy. Some days still cowering child of five, alive, inside towering man of forty. Cliche old as the Nile, prisoner of your guile. You do not own me because you gave me away. Absent thought, absent remorse, certain of my worthlessness, indifferent to my longing all those years ago. Small and helpless and still thinking there was a chance you hung the moon. Not even the decency to sell me off at the auction of vanity and false charm. Love the storybook paper mache daddy made up in my head to stop me from praying you dead to God or anybody listening. Wonder if you love the ticky tacky sun made up in your head to stop you from feeling less the big man incapable of spawning one like me hate you, knowing what a big word it is for taking my mama from me, not just once, but a little at the time, eroding her, bit by bit, word by word, blow by blow, concerned only about the show we acted out for the peanut gallery, and me not liking peanuts or galleries. Hate myself, knowing what a big word it is, in the still moments when I miss her more, moments when I know myself the whore, who has almost forgiven one of us, lance the sore, drain the pus. You asked for it, classic line of the rapist to the handsome woman in the low-cut blouse, for shit every time it was ever spoken. Lots of sons beaten by fathers with plow lines, used as mules, 
Some made models of the demons, improved their instruction. Some determined what they would never become. While unborn, we awaited the luck of the draw. Explanations I understand. Justifications give me pause. Excuses just don't quite hold up in the courtroom of not enough. Towering as a man of 40, tall like my daddy, reaching back across time and memory, through love and hate, hate and love, to claim the child of five, for my man-child to father my child-man, as a ghost takes over the old plow lines, and I till only the soil that is mine. And one more from this group. This one's called Revisiting Sin. <clears throat> what sort of father sells his child for fornication and affirmation? What sort of mother leaves the butcher knife in the kitchen drawer instead of in the breast of the father? What sort of place breeds such craven souls? I go to the cemetery to see him, pissed on his grave ten years before. What a tiresome cliché. Today I only say, the pretty one was always smart, and the smart one was always pretty. I'm willing to risk hell recognizing myself a good candidate just to believe you are already there. <clears throat> So, a little bit of social protest. <laughs> and I'm going to end with um, two poems that are works in progress. I'm still refining these. Um, these are emotional for me because these are about the loss of my mother. Um, but it's where I am and what I'm writing and thinking about these days. <clears throat> this one's called Not Today. You feel the tears, urgent and determined, coax your eyes to climb as far in their sockets as they can climb. Tighten every muscle in your face like a piano tuner hoping the middle C string does not break. You forbid it, manage to forestall the flow, and it warms and bewilders you, pisses you off a little that she knows anyway. I will be fine. And when one day I am not fine, you will be fine. Same voice that sang, here comes the Sandman. Fifty years have not forced a crack. Vulnerable and afraid, more for her cubs. The grizzly ever mother comforts her young. Daddy bears will have to get past her first. One in ten lung collapses, blithe doctor recites. Same verse to different congregation. And you figure at least one of those never inflates again. Somebody's deflated mama. But please God, you know by now, impervious to the shrewdest bargain, seldom supplicant, don't let it be mine, not mine today. You remember your love whispering from his pillow last night. I miss my mama so bad, I feel dead inside. You think, yes, I get that now. As they come to roll away their first procedure of the day, first person you ever loved, you think of lying down in front of the door, raising a den two security guards worthy. You don't care whether civilized people do such things. You let them take her. And when she comes back this time, you never see her quite the same. You praise the angel that never came. <clears throat> and I think probably what this one is about will be obvious. It's the last poem I'll share, and then I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. This one's called... April 28th, 2015. Gave the arthritic shizu a pain pill, wrapped in a sliver of American cheese the way she likes it. She turned away dismissively to resume her morning nap. Took the blue suit down off the hanger from the back of the closet and the equally blue tie she gave me, auspicious day, unsuited for casual. 
toasted the bagel considerably beyond perfection, added a smear of cream cheese to compensate the whipped kind, read the newspaper headlines, observed more than casually by my dismayed lover who had hidden the obits, no doubt in the kitchen drawer under my slotted spoons, or maybe in the garage with Christmas tinsel or potting soil to peek out in a more opportune season. Ignored the ringing of the phone, turned on the computer for morning email off again without opening the first message, heard the doorbell ring, and the lilies looked peaceful, glowing bright white that almost hurt my eyes, carried in by a careless stranger, deceptive on the foyer table, not my birthday or Easter, sitting next to the green plant that arrived with last night's dinner casserole. Felt my body rise through a haze deep as fog over Sipsy Swamp on a cold January morning. Felt my spirit sink, those bits still capable of thought and feeling, protesting the intrusion, dichotomy with no time to compensate. Look past my weeping sister, beyond my husband's gentle eyes, through cousins and neighbors and strangers into an unnamed empty place. Heard someone I did not recognize speak the words in my voice, death speech for the first person who ever loved me. She who bore me with joy and pain, she who I bear forward with pain and joy. Pulled the covers over my head, quiet for a long time, wondering how many had really died and if I cared. Query, can a conjoined soul live when half its body dies? Believing in God in this moment, just so I could hate him. <laughs> so, that's that. <laughs> um, I would be happy to respond to anything um, that interested you or troubled you or uh, to share a little bit about my aesthetic of art, to hear a little bit about yours, uh, what, would be, what would be a good way to spend the rest of our time? Yes. I'll, just, I'll thank you. I'm from East Tennessee. I'll <laughs> tell you how great it is to hear somebody say y'all and Cousin Minnie Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> really I'm just so proud you're here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, I gave up a really long, try, long time ago trying to be more than I am. I also gave up a really long time ago trying to be less than I am. So, uh, like that great American poet Tina Turner says, what you get is what you see. Ain't nothing more to it. So, uh, thank you. It's nice to see home folks, as we would, uh, as we would say. Anybody else? Well, yeah, Carol. You mentioned uh, talking about your aesthetic and. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, first off, I would say there's no wrong answer to that question. And my students get really bored hearing me say that, I imagine. And in my worldview, there's really very few questions that there are wrong answers to. There are just different ones. Um, my belief is that art starts with an autobiographical impulse and as you know as an English professor and many of you may know whole generations of writers have rebelled against the idea that they were writing autobiographically um, my thing is I think it all starts in a feeling that we have had an authentic feeling that we have had at some moment in time doesn't mean that we had to have every one of those experiences precisely the way that they were painted or precisely the way that um, they were composed into a symphony or written into a poem but I think they ring very hollow if we have not experience the feeling. If we haven't known what prejudice feels like, I'm pretty sure we can't write authentically about that. Um, if we haven't known what 
loss feels like. I'm pretty sure we can't write authentically uh, about that. So I don't think that art ends in autobiography, but I think whether people are willing to admit it or not, that more times than not, it, it begins in autobiography. But as I said, I, I have room for outright rebellion against that idea. And there are a lot of folks who uh, would, would rebel against it, um, push, push back against it. Um, but that's where it comes from, from me. And, um, you know, taking the time to write a poem, um, that may be hard for me. But when I sit down and, and go into that place, the, the words come out very easily. I have to work at fiction. I have to work at scholarly uh, things. Be it good or not good, uh, the poetry just kind of, you know, pours out. And the poets that I admire the most uh, are folks like Sylvia Plath, um, who, um, you know, lots of people said, girl, I don't need to know that much about you, you know, uh, <laughs> oversharing, you know. Um, there's no oversharing as far as, as I'm concerned in uh, uh, art. And that's what I admire so much about her work that it's just raw and naked and right there for you to just <coughs> do with what you want to, you know. And another poet that I admire a lot is... Uh, Walt Whitman, and what I admire about his work is its um, exuberance, you know, its exuberant use of uh, language, um, and um, that's kind of where the, the writing impulse comes for, for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just that it would, you would speak his name in the same uh, vein is a huge uh, compliment. You know, Lullaby is uh, one of my all-time uh, uh, favorite poems. Mortal, guilty, but to me, the entirely beautiful. And as far as I can tell, that's about as good of a line of poetry as anybody ever uh, penned. Yeah, Auden is pretty great. <laughs> Anything else? Is that with, with, on your teaching, is this the, is this how you teach? Uh-huh, I sit on the table and I ask questions. Because <laughs> uh, <coughs> it was like, I never got taught autobiographical, you know, and I thought I couldn't write. <laughs> um, you know, I'm out of sorts with some of my... Uh, academic colleagues, I believe you ought to let students start out writing autobiographically. Let them dip into the pool that they know the most about, that they have the most experience about and get comfortable. And then, then they can transition into a more academic, more detached kind of uh, writing. Um, that's what I think about teaching writing. What I'm teaching this semester is ethnic and minority literature, and um, I think the most important thing about art is not the answers that it provides, but the questions that it uh, asks. And um, I'm extremely comfortable with ambiguity, sometimes to the point that it uh, infuriates others who are less comfortable with uh, ambiguity. So um, I think the way art influences my, uh, I think the way my writing influences my uh, uh, teaching is that I just want my students to um, feel free and I want them to define themselves rather than accepting external definitions that others might place upon them. And um, 
I don't care so much whether I taught them at the end of the day what to think. In fact, I'd kind of be worried if I did. What I'd rather help them do is uncover the process of figuring out what they think, you know. Um, and uh, the students that I have here tonight bear out the fact that um, if you just sit quietly and are comfortable and quiet, then eventually uh, they become uncomfortable and quiet. Uh, these two, uh, uh, you know, fairly, fairly wonderfully quickly. Some you have to wait for longer than others. But um, they don't need me to tell them the answer. They just need for me to uh, ask them the question and be patient as they figure the answer out for themselves. <clears throat> that might not be true in algebra, by the way, but I have the <laughs> blessing of teaching uh, literature. So. <laughs> we all listened very, very patiently. I appreciate that. Um, any, anything else that you would want to say or ask? Yeah. Um, I noticed that you have a very strong sense of place, obviously going back to that um, place you just bring up of native soil. In moving to the valley, how has that impacted your view of home? You know, um, I'm not exactly ready to go all the way to Billy Joel saying home can be the Pennsylvania Turnpike. You know, home is just a, another word for you. But I'm pretty close to that because I, I had a, a, the, the preachers that my grandmother took me to visit with as a child. I can remember one of them hearing one of him, them say his favorite line over and over again. You don't need to come to church. You need to take church with you wherever it is that you go. And that's my view of home. Home is locked up in here. Home is locked up in here. Home is, you know, every fiber of my uh, being. So um, I need to go back and have my touchstone um, every now and then and see the places, walk along the... Uh, dirt roads of my youth, some of which are actually still dirt roads, but um, I, I um, kind of don't have to be at home. I kind of just can take home along with me wherever I uh, go, and I don't know if it works that way for everybody or not. If not, it's a special uh, blessing for me, as you know. Um, sense of place is probably the most common term that's associated with uh, Southern literature. You know, Eudora Welty very famously says in one writer's beginnings that here's how that she wrote that on Sunday afternoon uh, her parents would take a ride in the car and it was considered an affront to the neighbors if you left home with an empty seat in the car. You had to fill the car um, up. So she would always want to sit in the back seat between her mother and her mother's lady friend and then she would just look up and say, now talk. And she would just listen, you know, to whatever it was that they were saying. And if she's to be believed, later in her life, her short stories are largely the product of writing down what it was that uh, she heard. A lot of my poems are more introspective than that. They're not things that I heard. But the first one that I read you about the party line, I have heard my grandmother have that conversation with her sister Grace a thousand times as a uh, as a child, you know, and it's with me just as much today as it was the uh, first time uh, that I heard her say it. So, Yes, I'm sorry. I put on the glasses I can read with, which means that I can't actually see into the back of the room very well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have been told before that I have a fairly pronounced uh, accent uh, and uh, I um, have kind of enjoyed that most of my uh, uh, life actually. It's, uh, 
a novelty. And um, there have been a lot of people where I come from who've actually tried very hard to rid themselves uh, of that. But I would consider that um, like ridding myself of my great-grandmother's potato masher. I still, I have a four-generation hand potato masher that I still mash potatoes with. Mama Belle mashed potatoes with it first. Granny mashed potatoes with it after her. Mama mashed potatoes with it after them. And now I mash potatoes with it today. And the accent is kind of, uh, you know, part and parcel of the, the deal. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I've been, I've traveled fairly extensively uh, from the time that I was uh, a senior in college. The first time I got on an airplane, I was a senior in college, uh, going to a conference in Washington, D.C., and it was um, <laughs> I, the naivete that was inherent in what I learned along the way on that trip would probably shock you all, but I've gotten to travel and do a lot of neat things since then. When I moved here with David five months ago is the first time either of us has ever lived outside of the state of Mississippi. So, um, and really and truly the reason for that is uh, no two more tried and true mama's boys were ever born than the two of us and uh, we couldn't consider seriously moving away and having some wings and experiencing something different uh, while they were still here. Now that they're somewhere else, um, you know, we have had roots our whole lives and we decided that it was probably past time that we have uh, some some wings. But you know, the transition has been easier because when I came here to interview, folks kept telling me on the phone, it's going to be a very rural place. Heard that <laughs> word over and over again. A lot of people don't like it. Going to be a very rural place. Not going to be like Denver. You know, we want you to fly into Denver and drive to Alamosa and watch how it changes. Uh, you know, and then if you don't show up for the interview, we'll know you didn't, you know, uh, like it. When you got here, and I got here, David came with me, and I'm like, rural? You know, this is 20 times the size of the little town. That's the truth. 20 times the size of the little town where... Uh, I grew up, you know, I grew up milking cows and picking vegetables in the uh, field and catching fish for supper. So there wasn't a lot to get used to about the uh, rural nature of Alamosa to me. It felt like home. The only thing that was different was I kept looking for a direction in which there wasn't a pretty view, figuring surely eventually I would find a direction when I couldn't look off and see a uh, beautiful mountain. And I hadn't really found that, uh, that direction yet. So in that regard. I don't know. We'll see if they will. Um, you know, I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting uh, Aaron Abeda since I got here, who is uh, an internationally renowned poet that we have on our faculty, and I've had the pleasure of reading several of his books that he shared with me, and this is his postage stamp of native soil that he's writing about in his work. And I know I'll be influenced by the fact that I'm here, but I suspect my artistic impulses will continue to go back to my earliest of days, which is where they always, always seem to, uh, to take me, you know, back to, back to where I started from. I almost, I'm not sure I could write yet, at least, authentically about the mountains. I stand in awe of them, but I'm not really of them yet, and they're not of me yet. Um, so I'd love to try at some point in time, but um, I don't know for sure how that will turn out. Joyce. How many generations 
oh, about as many as you can go, I guess. Um, one of my great-grandmothers was a member of the Choctaw tribe uh, in Mississippi, but great-grandmother is not that far uh, back. Before she died, my mother's favorite thing to do for the last couple of years of her life was genealogy. And I don't even remember, David, do you? 12, 15 generations, you know, back to when Mississippi started, pretty much. She uh, uh, would trace us there, and then to the, before that to the uh, Carolinas, uh, and before that um, to uh, Ireland. Uh, but that was only one side of my uh, family. But um, I, it, had, you, had you met my mother, you would have seen, though she looked very Caucasian, she had features about her big, expressive, beautiful eyes, high-set cheekbones. You, can, you could see the Native American ancestry in her, coupled with the uh, European ancestry in her as well. So we're, we're kind of a conglomeration of a lot of uh, different people uh, who, who came together there. David grew up in Mississippi, rural Mississippi as well, about three hours uh, south of where I grew up and we figured out once upon a time that when I was in college he was in middle school which is a very humbling experience uh, <laughs> if you are me um, but you know we did not know each other until we were uh, until we were older and you know I can remember as a young teenager figuring out early, immediately in my life knowing that I was different but not quite figuring out what that difference was maybe until I was a young teenager and then kind of figuring out that maybe I'm gay and then it occurring to me that there must probably be like seven gay people in the whole state of Mississippi and none of them lived anywhere near where uh, uh, I lived, you know. Uh, of course that wasn't true, but that's how it seemed to me as a child. I can remember coming out to uh, my mother and her saying, Okay, I, were you going to tell me something that I did not know, you know? I was just uh, kind of waiting, you know, for you to get around to uh, stating what for me has been the obvious for uh, your whole life. Um, clearly, uh, she was the uh, most influential person in my life. Um, you know, she... Um, made signs and walked in marches and integrated businesses and protested for equal pay for equal work for uh, women and dared the whole world to bully her gay child uh, and then dared the whole world to generation to, to bully a whole generation of his friends when uh, he got uh, older. So um, I didn't have a real traditional um, southern childhood in a lot of ways. Uh, my mother and my grandparents were very much at odds though. Honesty in all things, even when the honesty is hard. You know, my grandparents uh, believed in uh, racial segregation and my grandfather believed in the subjugation of women to men and um, you know imagine then having to cope your uh, my mom always said that she was God's kind of little joke uh, on, on them because they had to figure out how to cope with this hellion that they had uh, raised who wouldn't accept any of the uh, the boundaries that they tried to place on her. You know, David and I became the face of the gay rights movement in Mississippi uh, a long time, a very long time ago. And um, so our life has just kind of always been about um, civil rights in one form or another. So. My poetry is kind of this weird melding of, you know, life on the farm meets, uh, you know, meets um, 
social protest, I guess. So, yeah. She did. Um, actually, she was a very fine writer. I have a novel in a box that she wrote the last years of her life. It's actually quite good, and I'm actually qualified to know whether it uh, was or not. Um, I'd like to publish, publish it posthumously for her um, one of these days for her uh, grandchildren. Uh, she won a couple of pretty big prizes for short story writing toward the uh, end of her life. And actually, when the anthology comes out in the spring that I was telling you about, uh, David, who some of you may know is a newspaper columnist, has written a newspaper column in Mississippi for many years and is now writing for the Valley Courier. David, my mother, and I are all anthologized in a book of uh, Southern writers, and of course I'm not um, all that impressed by the fact that I'm in it, but I'm really impressed by the fact that she's in it. She had had a lot of uh, small things published in her life, but um, I don't know if this would mean anything to you, but I remember her saying, I'm finally going to have something published in a hard copy book, you know, uh, not one of those flimsy uh, uh, soft copy books, but an actual book with a hard cover on it. So I'm sure I will be dissolved in tears for a week whenever the uh, uh, book comes out in the spring. Yeah, Jeff. That's okay. Uh, is there a relationship between idealism and authenticity in your writing or your personal philosophy? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, idealism is important to me. Authenticity is much more uh, important. And I though think they're similar, I don't make them... Uh, synonyms exactly. For me, idealism is a, a, a thought process um, and authenticity is a way of life when you might live out your idealism. And um, so, so authenticity is, you know, for good and a lot of times for bad, kind of maybe the defining characteristic of me and if it's the defining characteristic of me then it's probably the defining characteristic of my work as well. I have no energy left for pretense um, for myself or for anybody else really you know so tell me a truth even if it's a really hard truth even if it's one that you know that I'm not going to like. Uh, I would still rather have that than for you to pander to try to figure out what it is that I want to hear. I always say to my students in class, I do not need you to agree with me. That is the last thing that I, I already know what I think. What I need is for you to have an original thought of some kind that, that adds value <laughs> to, the, uh, to the conversation, you know. And they do, over and over and uh, over again. Um, so, I don't know if it works this way for everybody. Um, I become a little more pragmatic and maybe a little less idealistic as I uh, age and some people then would say that I'm just finally finding a balance that I needed to find a uh, long time ago but um, I also get braver as I get uh, older and um, that allows you to be more authentic I think when you either don't have anything to lose or you're willing to lose whatever it is that uh, the price might be for that authenticity. He's a developmental psychologist right here. We're studying aging. <laughs> 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 <Isn't that right? laughs> 
Well, thank you all so much for coming out on this cold night when you could have been 423 other places and uh, letting me share uh, a little bit of me with you and for sharing a little bit of you with me. I appreciate it so much and um, I hope everybody will have a great evening. Courtney, anything?